Um, so actually, we're going to start talking a little bit about what's been going on in Congress before moving on to some of the other um, aspects of the administration. So Charlotte, you've testified before a couple congressional committees about why you think um, we need to update the antitrust laws. Why do you think that's needed? And what do you think of some of the bills under consideration right now? Um, thank you, Leah, and I'm so excited to be here talking about these important issues today. Um, so we are facing a serious problem of dominant digital platforms that are too powerful in this country. Um, antitrust, I think, has been trying to address this problem, um, but we have seen that it is not working. It has not been sufficient. Um, and there's a variety of uh, particular limitations that I think have been holding antitrust back. Um, I don't want to uh, say that it's just about politics. I think that there really have been um, limitations in the precedents that we have seen that, that make it incredibly difficult to use today's antitrust laws. Um, we are trying. So there is currently um, an antitrust case against Google. There is currently an antitrust case against Facebook from DOJ and FTC. Um, and I think that those are strong cases. But even if those cases are wildly successful, um, we are are still going to need legislation. We need more. Um, so there has been a package of bills starting on the House side that has had great success, made it through the Judiciary Committee markup um, that would do uh, a full package of um, important tools. What has made the most progress so far on the Senate side is the non-discrimination requirement. Um, so I think this could be really powerful in addressing the special situation that we have here where dominant digital platforms also own companies that are competing on the platform. And they control the key um, avenue of competition against themselves, which is their own platforms. Um, so this is a, a tricky situation that we have been trying to get antitrust to take care of for a long time, um, but it's very clear now that new laws will be needed. Um, Jennifer, let's bring you in because I know Net Choice has been very actively opposed to a lot of this legislation. You know, I have a, a very different read of what these bills are and what they would do than, than Charlotte would, um, in part because I do think the consumer welfare standard has been a wonderful tool and is a very objective tool when it comes to antitrust and when it comes to the ability to make sure that we are focused on consumers and that we're continuing to see a dynamic marketplace evolve. When it comes to what some of these proposals would do, I'm going to start with the self-preferencing proposal that was mentioned. Um, I think we really need to ask that question of not only what would this do to current large tech companies, but what does this actually mean for the consumer? What does this actually mean for some of the smaller players that have benefited from this tech ecosystem, as well as what a dramatic change this would be for antitrust law and what that might mean beyond the tech sector. So with that in mind, I kind of have three key points with what I see that that proposal would do. The first of which would be a loss of services that many consumers enjoy and that they are not being harmed by. This means everything from when you go on Google, if you had decided to go out to lunch, if you were here at Stay of the Net in person and typed in restaurants near me, and at the top popped up a map with the hours and the reviews all conveniently there, that information could still be there somewhere in the Google search, but it probably wouldn't be that top result that has really made it more efficient for a lot of us and that was a response to what consumers wanted. It means that the Prime logo when you go to, when you go to shop on Amazon might not be able to be there so that you know what products you can and can't get that quickly. Secondly, there's a lot of questions about what this would do for privacy and security what this might mean in terms of some of the interoperability requirements, what that would mean for consumers, as well as what that would mean for businesses on the platform. Then finally, I think we have to address the fact that particularly when we're talking about the Senate bill, there's not a lot to keep it only in the tech sector. These have largely been portrayed as, anti as bills responding to anti-big tech, to concerns about the tech sector, but there's a lot, the way they're structured could easily reach uh, large retailers like Walmart or large financial industries, and we're increasingly hearing from some of the proponents of antitrust reform on the left that they want to expand this well beyond the tech sector. So I think that's something else we have to consider. Antitrust is a very powerful tool when it comes to intervening in, a, in the economy and in a sector of, the, of business, and we want to make sure it's being used with an objective purpose and not for political motivations. Thank you. As some, you're... Um, organization is very focused on consumers. I wondered if um, you could talk a little bit about why you guys um, support the bills. Thanks. 
Thanks. Uh, well, thanks for having us. And uh, yes, so we are a consumer-focused organization. We look at this uh, from the viewpoint of consumers. And uh, we think these bills will be good for consumers. I have to disagree with a few points there. First, these bills focus on the tech sector. Uh, you know, I think the bills have done a very good job of actually identifying where there are problems in the market and uh, prohibiting obvious dis uh, exclusionary conduct in those markets. Uh, so, you know, it'll be the Google, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, Apple, uh, Amazon that are going to be covered. But I would go further and say that even amongst these companies, not everything they do is going to be covered. Now, we like, uh, you know, the products and services these companies produce. Uh, I want Apple to innovate uh, and produce new services. And if Apple wants to enter, you know, search services, online search services, it can do so under this bill. And there are no restrictions on Apple doing that. So uh, it's, I think these bills, and I, I, none of us have actually said what these bills are, so I probably should say that up first, is the Open App Markets Act and the American Online Choice and Innovation Act. Uh, the latter is a more broad-reaching bill, which uh, imposes uh, non-discriminatory requi non -discriminatory requirements on a bunch of uh, companies. And the App Store bill closely focuses on Apple and Google's uh, monopoly on the App Store. So, sorry, so going back, so, you know, these companies will continue to have a bunch of, uh, can continue to innovate. So the bills actually do a good job of balancing, on the one hand, introducing more competition into the system and leaving enough space for folks to innovate, including these big companies. Um, loss of services, etc. cetera. Uh, I don't think those are arguments I buy at all. Um, what these bills do is make sure that these companies have to do business somewhat differently. So let me, let me give you an example. Uh, you know, Prime. What, what, what's the problem with Prime? It's not that good, uh, Amazon has that service, but the issue is that Amazon preferences products that use the Prime logo. What this will do is, if I'm a seller of mousetraps and I want to use DHL or some other fulfillment service to deliver my, service, to deliver my product, my product should be treated the same way as another mousetrap that's sold on with the, with the Prime uh, badge. So that's all this bill does. So uh, they will have to change the way they do business. You know, it's, life's going to get more complicated for Google, Amazon, Facebook. Uh, but I think that's what we want. We want these companies to change the way they do business so that consumers have more choice uh, and there's more space for competitors. Can I make one more point? Or is that okay? Sorry, yeah. Sorry, come here. You may, yeah. then we'll go on yeah. to Aurelia. So the thing about consumer welfare standard, right? And this, this is brought up very often. Uh, so as an economist, consumer welfare, as I define it, means a lot of things. It means not just price, but what we call quality-adjusted price, which means uh, you know, privacy, security, the quality of the goods and service, everything. So what's happened, I think, uh, and I think Charlotte is probably better at this, but over the years, the way the courts have interpreted the consumer welfare standard has meant that they've sort of uh, added consumer surplus and producer surplus together so they always look at total welfare, whereas the original idea behind these laws was always to look at consumer surplus and look at the consumer side of things. And so I think that's why we need some of these new laws, as Charlotte said. Thanks. Aurelian, let's bring you in here. Right. Thank, thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure to be among these uh, great panelists. I think I want to uh, step back for a moment before answering those questions of uh, what, do, what do, should we change or what should we, do be, do, should be, we be doing? I think it's, quite, it's very important to say why there is this antitrust momentum, why we talk about antitrust and why it's becoming so popular those days. I think we are in a new gilded age. We are in a new revolution. And I say gilded age because the, the main proponents of the antitrust reforms, uh, Tim Hu and Senator Klobuchar, have in their books uh, subtitles of the new gilded age. And so we are in the new Gilded Age, uh, this Gilded Age from the 21st century that refers to the 19th century, where there was a massive amount of innovations and, of course, disruptions. And so back then, the Gilded Age was not the lack of competition, but was the excess of competition, too much competition, which basically means disruptive competition, when the railroads were able to reach some farmers with lower price, uh, and that disrupted some rural communities and local communities that suddenly have too low price. Um, and so this is innovation and this is competition. And unfortunately, there's this, all this narrative saying like, we live in a world those days where there's a lack of competition. 
I think that is incorrect in the sense that there's no lack of competition. There's a disruptive competition that in itself displays competitors and displays rivals. And that's hurtful. That's true. But the process of competition is not to protect competitors, it's to protect consumers. And, and, and the thing is, uh, we really need to protect this competitive process where disruption can take place. I mean, this large company, think about uh, digital advertising. Digital advertising has completely disrupted print advertising or TV advertising or radio advertising. But this is still a disruptive process that we favor and we should embrace rather than having this attack lash. And so why do I speak about this gilded age? Because back then, at the end of the 19th century, this gilded age spurred what we call this antitrust populism, this view of populist antitrust whereby big is bad. And the point was to protect smaller businesses against the scale economies and the scope economies of big businesses, which would lower prices. And these low prices were not uh, uh, were, were too low for uh, lagard firms that couldn't compete. And I think we are exactly in the same moment. We, in the same moment of, of a new populist view of antitrust, whereas big companies are bad, and we see that with antitrust bills, with the, uh, President Biden executive order on competition, where the target is more market power and bigness in itself than the abuse. Why do I say this? Well, if we are talking about anti-competitive conduct, then we should prosecute this anti-competitive conduct irrespectively of the size of those companies. But what antitrust bills and other um, uh, reforms do is precisely to single out few companies and to prohibit these companies to engage in some pro-competitive and pro-innovative conduct that should these should smaller companies do that, then it would be just completely unacceptable. So I think what is most important is to have this antitrust perspective, which is more size neutral, so that we can really look at the anti-competitiveness of this conduct and prosecute with a strong antitrust enforcement within the current laws, rather than trying to single out uh, some companies that may be the disruptors of today's in this new Gilead age, and we will prohibit these companies to engage in competitive behavior that will be pro-consumers and, and pro-innovation. So I think we need to be careful and to put that into a historical pers perspective that we've been there before. Uh, in the beginning of the century, there was this chain store wars where the, 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 the target were supermarkets, which were charging too low prices. I think if we start thinking about too low prices as the main point of antitrust prosecutions, then at the end of the day, smaller competitors may benefit, those lagout firms, but the consumers will uh, be hurt. Um, so we have to be extremely careful. And I will say that these current antitrust laws are very flexible. Um, these current antitrust laws are the economic charter of American economy in the sense that they're extremely flexible. When they were drafted, they were drafted at the end of the 19th century, and it did, they didn't prevent us to break up AT&T or to prosecute Microsoft. And I don't think Senator Sherman, when he draft, drafted these bills, um, he thought about Microsoft. So what I'm saying is that it is, these rules are very flexible, and they, I think they are up to date for the 21st century. Thank you. Um, you brought me a little bit where I wanted to go next, which was onto the um, Biden executive order on competition. Last summer, um, President Biden signed a, an executive order um, suggesting all of the government agencies sort of take a look at competition in their sp respective sectors. Um, there were 74 individual things in there that he suggested to do, but more broadly, think about ways to um, uh, increase competition across the economy. Um, why don't we start with you, Summit, and um, then we'll, we'll sort of go on if you had any thoughts sort of about the executive order and um, sort of this idea of focusing on some of the biggest players in the economy. Um, sure, thanks. Um, so I have the executive order in front of me, right? And you're right. The, the, the focus increasingly is uh, on more than just prices, as, as it should be. Uh, now, if you look at the executive order, it, it talks about, uh, you know, what competition means for workers, for small businesses, for entrepreneurs, 
and, for, and also then for consumers, right? So what the executive order does very well, I think, is puts a framework and tells us why competition is important for the whole economy. And it affects, and it's just more than prices. So it is a value chain uh, that, that's affected. Uh, so that, that's the first point, right, about, about the executive order. The second thing that it does is that it allows and clearly states government policy on existing laws. So I agree with you. In many cases, the existing laws are flexible and there's room to use those, right, to make progress. And that's the direction, largely, in, that the executive order pushes us in, is to use those existing laws more effectively. Uh, I think I'll stop that now. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Um, do either of you all want to? Charlotte, go ahead. Sure, and then I'll take a minute to respond to some of Aurelia's points about um, the legislation, if that's okay. Um, so I think that the executive order is a, a promise on the part of the Biden administration um, setting some goals, and I'm really looking forward to um, a lot of work that, that we're all going to have to do and that the administration is going to have to do to make this happen. Um, but I think um, sort of jumping off of Sumit's point, I think he's, you know, using the tools at his disposal. And so that's why it's focused on existing law. Um, but I don't want to discount the role of Congress. Um, we need to be using all of these tools at the same time. Um, the executive branch should be doing all the things that it can do and the agency should be doing all the things that they can do. Um, but I think on its own, that is not going to be enough and we need legislation because these companies are very powerful and this problem is large and complex. Um, this point about disruption, I think, is, is really interesting. And, and I really see the, the goal of a lot of this advocacy is not a, a theory that prices are too low right now. I don't hear people saying that. Um, it's that innovation isn't happening. And I think these bills are targeted at innovation. And a lot of the advocacy around improving the antitrust laws is about innovation and the innovation that we are not seeing today because there were opportunities for disruption. And I think... The example I often think of is when Facebook was allowed to purchase Instagram, there was a big sort of disruptive moment that consumers were really switching from desktop to mobile as their sort of primary way of accessing the internet and social media, and Facebook was really having trouble with that transition. And that could have been an opportunity for a new competitor um, to unseat Facebook from that very powerful position that they were in, and Facebook was allowed to then buy that competitor. Now, there's a variety of reasons that may have happened, um, but I think that's an indication of sort of the, the potential for disruption that is being lost today. And it's difficult to envision what uh, a more innovative um, internet might look like. I think that we have sort of lost that imagination because um, we have had the same products for a very long time now. Um, thinking about, you know, seeing a Prime logo so that you know, um, or seeing the, the restaurant show up on Google Maps. And it's hard for me as an advocate to say, you know, here's a million dollar idea that, that the next big entrepreneur would come up with that we could be using right now that would be a much better product. Um, but those people who have those ideas have not been given the opportunity to do that uh, because these gatekeepers that really benefit from the status quo are preventing that from happening. If I can jump in here too and, and somewhat pick up on something Charlotte just said and then go back a, a little bit to the executive order more generally. Innovation has often been our best competition policy. If we'd been having this conversation 20 years ago, we would be talking about how Yahoo won the search wars and what we're going to do about AOL and whether MySpace is a natural monopoly. And, you know, critics like to say that this time it's different. But if you look at the news stories, we're seeing new competitors still. We're seeing TikTok emerge. We're seeing that Meta has fallen below the threshold or close to the threshold at times. So this idea that, you know, we're not seeing innovation and, and disruption, I think that it's, we're still seeing a, a lot of research and development investment. We're still seeing new competitors emerge. We may not always be able to predict what that new competitor is, just like you said of, I don't always, can't say, and this is going to be the billion dollar idea. And that's what's great about having a marketplace that allows that next great billion dollar idea to emerge that none of us could then 10 years from now imagine our lives without. I do think when it comes to the executive order, and I know we'll get into some of the more specific actions we've seen out of the DOJ and the FTC, what we've really seen is an increased degree of antitrust scrutiny and an increased amount of 
emphasis placed on this area, not only in the tech space, but much more generally. And a question of what that means, not only for these large players, but also for some of the dynamics that are going on in these industries, particularly, particularly around things like mergers and acquisitions that can be extremely beneficial at times. I also think there, it raises those questions, again, of where is the focus on the consumer and the consumer welfare standard and that objective standard that has really served to provide signals to consumers, to small players, and to large players on what it means to compete fairly in the marketplace. Great. So one of the things that was in the um, executive order that I wanted to drill down on is there were... Um, I believe six or seven requests that the FTC consider rulemaking on a per couple different things. One of them um, is pretty interesting. It, it focuses on perhaps making a rulemaking on privacy. There's also um, a suggestion that they make a rule defining a little bit more broadly what an unfair method of competition is. So I wanted um, to get some thoughts from you guys. I mean, what do you think of the FTC undertaking this kind of rulemaking? Do you think it's clear that they can? And uh, where should what should the FTC be looking at here? No, I was saying yes. I think I just want to uh, come back to FTC rulemaking and these uh, and these and the legislation that we're talking about as well, because I think they play a similar role. The legislation, I believe, will empower the FTC to uh, more concretely make some of these rules, which is why I think the legislation and the FTC rulemaking especially when it comes to unfair uh, methods of competition, non-discrimination, et cetera, are linked. Uh, and I think it's fundamentally, we don't, well, I think there's a disagreement between this panel here a bit. But if you look at the market evidence, you know, Google's had 90% of the search market for many years. Uh, Apple and Google have had, you know, a monopoly on our smartphones for the last 10 years. The market shares have been more or less the same. So I think we are, at a, we are at a different starting point. We're not starting from a position where there's competition in the market. We're starting from a position where there isn't competition in the market. And the question then is, well, what can we do to introduce more competition, more innovation? And that's what this FTC uh, rulemaking will be about. You know, it's to define non-discrimination standards, uh, ban or limit. I wouldn't say ban, but limit self-preferencing when, when inappropriate, require interoperability, uh, and talking about you know, what, what this could do and what innovation would look like, I, I always like this example, so I'll give it again, is that you know, today if I'm a, smart, if I'm a smartwatch uh, competitor and I want to compete with Apple's uh, watch, uh, I'm fully dependent on Apple allowing my smartwatch to interoperate appropriately with its iOS and iPhone. That is not something that happens today. Now, an FTC rulemaking would say, hey, you have to allow equitable... Uh, interoperability to a competing smartwatch would help consumers a lot because you could have other smartwatch competitors coming in and, um, you know, and competing with Apple. Uh, another example on closed ecosystems, by the way, is, you know, my, my windshield uh, wiper fluid ran out the other day and I was uh, looking to buy some. I looked on Amazon and it was 19 bucks. The same product on, at Home Depot, five minutes from my home, was $3.00. So, you know, there are huge advantages that these uh, companies get from operating these closed ecosystems. And it's essential that we have rulemaking and legislation to break those down and make a more interoperable system. Aurelia, do you want to? Yeah. Uh, just one word on the executive order, uh, for, because I haven't addressed that. Uh, before looking at the executive order, you have to look at the assumptions behind those, this executive order. Um, so... First, before being critical of the executive order, I will just say that there's a number of um, um, proposals that are very uh, welcoming, like uh, setting over-the-counter hearing aids or scrutinizing hospital mergers. I think these are good proposals. Uh, also to look at unreasonable um, non-compete clause in order to favor labor mobility, that's great. Um, to limit unreasonable restrictions on occupational licensing, also, that's great because states can restrict labor mobility. So there are a few uh, instances where the executive order get it right. But what the executive order get it very wrong is the, the, the assumptions behind the executive order, saying like not only there's a lack of competition, there's no co competition, but also there's a, a massive amount of concentration. I mean, at, at EIF, we looked at the data, and the data doesn't support those assumptions. Over the last 20 years, 
the corporate concentration in America went from 34% in 20 years to 35%, which is insignificant, which doesn't mean there's any increase. 4% of the industries in America are highly concentrated. 4%, meaning that 96% are either not concentrated or moderately concentrated. And even more, what we found is that over the last 20 years, those industries that they were the, the lowest, uh, that had the lowest ratio of concentrations increased by 25%. What does it mean? It means that those industries that are not concentrated were the most likely to increase. So we, see, we don't see this massive amount of concentration that the executive order of uh, President Biden claims and, and relies on. Uh, so we don't see consolidation. And I would say that even if there's concentration, even if there's consolidation, consolidation and concentration doesn't mean no competition. I mean, think of airlines. Would we want like a hundreds of airlines in, in this country? No, you need some sort of consolidation. You need some sort of concentration in order to rip off the economies of scale, economies of scope, and to uh, offer low price. So some, so some sense of consoli consolidation and concentrations are necessary in order also to compete globally with European Chinese uh, tech companies. So that's the first point. Uh, the executive order um, has a wrong diagnostic, and so it's very uh, unlikely that the recommendation will be right, unless uh, there are some few exceptions, as I, as I noted. Um, now on the FTC rulemaking authority, I just want to say one thing. The FTC has rulemaking authority on consumer protection. That's not contested. It's uncontroversial. But the FTC doesn't have rulemaking authority when it comes to unfair method of competition. I will just mention a case from the Supreme Court, 1920, the Graz case, that precisely said that the FTC doesn't have authority when it comes to unfair method of competition. Only courts can define what is unfair method of competition, not the commission. That's the case from 1920. So right after the F FTC Act has been passed in 1914, and we don't have any other case from the Supreme Court for the last 100 years. So we don't know what the Supreme Court stands will be, but it's very likely that it will just be the same stance as back to 1920. So we know the FTC doesn't have a rulemaking authority on unfair method of competition. Should the FTC engage in rulemaking authority, because we see that it's going to happen, right? Um, there's a risk that not only it will be, there, it will be subsequently uh, followed by a judicial backlash, but also, economically speaking, I think it will be quite detrimental let me, let me explain why. I think it will be a shift from exposed judicial enforcement of, an, of antitrust rules toward more ex-ante uh, type of regulations. And this, this sort of ex-ante type of regulation is exactly what we see in Europe with the Digital Markets Act. And it is underpinned by a precautionary logic, meaning that it's forbidden unless you prove otherwise. The presumption is against the company it has to prove the pro-competitive and pro-innovative effect of the conduct it wants to engage into. So what does it mean? It means that it's a reversed burden of proof. There's a prohibition unless you prove otherwise. It's not freedom unless it's prohibited, but it's a reversed burden of proof so that it, gives, it, it creates a sort of precautionary attitude, a risk-averse attitude to companies, as I was referred, are disruptive. I mean, disruption is precisely to break up the status quo, to break up those incumbents in many different industries, and to be radical. Otherwise, there wouldn't be disruption. It would be like marginal competition, marginal increase. But that's not what we want in terms of uh, innovation leadership. So not only it would be legally very questionable for the FTC to engage in rulemaking authority when it comes to unfair method of competition, but it would be economically detrimental because it would just create this precautionary logic that uh, we take inspiration from Europe. And th that's very detrimental for the disruptiveness of American innovation. Thanks. Charlotte, I wondered if um, we could go to you and also if you could address a little bit about the um, judicial enforcement versus regulations. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right. So uh, 
Real quick before I forget, though, I want to respond to this point about ex ante. Um, so I, I don't think that it's like a, a necessary component of the use of the tool of rulemaking that they would be automatically putting in the precautionary principle. That's like a particular rule that you may be concerned about, but I think they could make rulemaking with a variety of substance and content. And I think that there probably are some situations where we need presumptions and I, I want that burden of proof reversed. Um, but rulemaking is a tool like any other and, and it can do a variety of things. Um, I've forgotten the question that you actually asked. <laughs> I was so focused on my retort. Um, I was saying it, on the FTC rulemaking and if you wanted to address um, court cases versus regulation. Yes, okay. Um, so uh, I think Aurelia is right to an extent that there is, um, you know, some question. Like, I, I think it's quite clear when you look at the plain text of the law, I think it's quite clear when you look at the legislative history that the FTC does have rulemaking authority under unfair methods of competition, but I do expect that it will face litigation when they attempt to do it, and so we will find out. Um, but it is such an important tool that I think um, can really provide predictability for businesses um, to have uh, rules that state very clearly um, what the requirements are. Um, but it also will be so much more efficient for FTC resources. And we need to give the FTC a lot more resources. This is something that Congress really needs to do. It should be a high priority, and I know that it is. Um, but uh, bringing cases um, in order to clarify the law and um, you know, notify businesses that um, this type of conduct is in violation is very slow. Um, I think about the example of the pay-for-delay cases. Um, it's not worth going into the details of what pay-for-delay is if you're not aware of it, but uh, it was a healthcare issue. And the FTC spent decades bringing cases to try to clarify pay-for-delay and show that pay-for-delay was concerning. Um, it did finally bear fruit um, but 20 years on one issue, uh, you know, that's a ton of staff resources. That's a ton of time that consumers are being harmed. Um, so it would just be so much more efficient to be able to use both adjudication and rulemaking. And so it would be really valuable if we um, can use unfair methods of competition rulemaking at the FTC. Uh, I, I do anticipate that it would face litigation, um, but it's, it is worth the investment because it would be so efficient. Um, and does that answer the, yeah. yeah. Um, Jennifer, I wondered if you had any thoughts. Yeah, I want to jump in on a, a couple of things that have been said. And, and first, I apologize if I misheard something, but I want to make clear, I do believe these are competitive markets still. I do believe the tech sector is still dynamic and competitive, that we are still seeing new entrants and whatnot. So, uh, okay. Okay, it's like, it's like, it's so, so we do have some disagreement on the, uh, on the panel. Um, but but, but I, um, when we're talking about the FTC, I, two of the points that were brought up earlier, one of which is around privacy. Um, we often hear privacy kind of brought up in the broader competition debate, in the broader debate over antitrust reform. And I think we need to recognize that antitrust is a very specific tool for a very specific purpose. And while there can be certainly impacts on privacy, if our goal is to have a federal data privacy framework, that should be a different debate. It's a debate that I very much think we should be having is a federal data privacy framework. And I think I could get agreement on this panel on that too. <laughs> but when we're talking about the impact of antitrust on privacy, that's going to be a separate conversation um, than the one just more generally about what we should do with privacy that is a top concern for many consumers and voters. I think it's very important to be aware of what's going on at the FTC, not only because we've seen some very significant, very significant actions, including around uh, the Section 5 statement, including around the vertical mergers guidelines. We've seen a growing partisan divide um, at the FTC where things that, that had been largely agreed upon kind of as a, a principled approach are now being very, are being very divided and we're seeing some pretty dramatic shifts it seems or at least potential for some pretty dramatic shifts in some of these policies that have come about. Um, but when we look back to those congressional bills that we were talking about earlier, a lot of them are looking at vesting a lot more power and a lot more enforcement and a lot more resources at the FTC. So we certainly want to very much pay attention 
to what it's doing with the current power it has, especially if there is a, a potential impetus to give it even more power over this extremely, um, a, this tool that has a lot of ability to, to intervene in various sectors of the economy. Uh, first, I would just like to challenge a point that you made, sorry, Oriel. That uh, you know the the underlying assumption of the Biden executive order is that there is more concentration, and there is evidence to show that that is indeed the case. Uh, you know, some evidence is probably better than others. I would uh, just refer folks to the Thomas uh, Philippe, I think a, 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 a country, a, 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 a fellow, fellow countryman of yours, who presented uh, you know in the Joint Economic Committee, and he looks at ranking of companies, you know, of the companies who've been in the top hundred. Uh, over f over five year periods, and he and he finds that the same company that this the ranking should change a lot more uh, before 2000, but then after that it changed a lot less. So the same companies remain in the top hundred, uh, and that's not changed. So that's you know that's sort of evidence that en everyone can understand and relate to. I think um, on the uh, executive order, by the way, and the FTC. Uh, rulemaking issue. Now, I, I'm not a lawyer, uh, you know, but what I, I do think if we have these uh, bills pass, and these are bipartisan bills, uh, we have the executive order, we have these bills that pass, that will make it a lot easier for the FTC to do rulemaking and uh, give it some precedent to do that. So I think that's, uh, that, that's, important, uh, that's an important point to make as well. Uh, and there's a lot said, yes, I'm going to stop there, but I'll keep going. Yeah, thanks. Charlotte, I saw you grab your microphone. Thank so. you. Um, so you asked about privacy rulemaking, and I think it's important to point out that privacy rulemaking could also take place on the consumer protection side under Magnus and Moss, where there is no question that the FTC does have rulemaking authority. Um, so Jennifer was talking about um, antitrust and the impact that antitrust can have on privacy, but the FTC also could um, do rulemaking on this directly. And... Uh, Magnus and Moss is, has a bad reputation for being an incredibly slow process, um, which is certainly true. Uh, but they have, um, I think, you know, done some excellent research recently within the FTC, and Commissioner Slaughter uh, has spoken about how we can actually speed up the Magnus and Moss process significantly. So I think that that's uh, another good option for privacy rulemaking. Great. Um, I wanted to open it up for questions from the audience. So if you all have a question, our delightful. He will bring you the mic. If not, I will keep asking questions because that's my job, actually. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy Pesner, Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, it strikes me that one challenge of sort of talking about competition in the digital space is defining the markets uh, in the sense of is Facebook a competitor with YouTube or TikTok? or formerly Instagram, or even Netflix. And so um, I believe a recent appellation from the uh, FTC called TikTok a content and broadcasting service. Uh, so I wonder what your thoughts are on how we would define the markets and what particular factors and criteria we might consider if trying to figure out who's competing with who. i just go first. I think, I think that's uh, sort of the, uh, the right point to raise, but the wrong question to ask, because I think the problem is that today, to enforce existing laws, uh, there seems to be this presumption that you have to define markets, to find market power. Whereas I don't think in these complex, uh, you know, in this complex ecosystem, where you have Google and Facebook operating so many different services across the digital ecosystem, you know, you have to look at the whole thing together. You have to look at direct evidence, uh, and which is what these builds do. I think they sort of they sort of get away from this strict need to define a market but still say we can see that there's tangible effects of, these, of this market power when you look at the terms and conditions that folks are, have to sign on to. The fact that there aren't any other alternatives that consumers can go to, uh, you know, when you look at Facebook or Amazon, or the fact that uh, these, it's very difficult for new entrants to come in because they can't interoperate because these guys have network effects, so on and so forth. So I think the whole idea is we don't need to do that anymore. We need to look at direct evidence and the ecosystem of services? So I think that this is exactly the right question to, to ask. Um, I think this is the question that's playing out in the courts right now, particularly around the FTC case 
involving Facebook of what is the, the question of market definition and, and to kind of pick on the examples that were just given at the end there. I mean, it, you have Amazon, you have Shopify, you have, uh, you know, you have Walmart increasingly relevant in, in that sector as well. You have Facebook, you have TikTok, you have Twitter. You, you know, one of my favorite moments is always when someone tweets about how Facebook has a monopoly. Um, you know, it, the, I think that we do see a growing discourse and a growing question around how to, pro, how to define these markets. But I think in the majority of cases, many of us, even in our own experience, have an experience with a competitor or an alternative where we can see that there is more than one option for most of even these large digital platforms. So the question in antitrust law is not, is there possibly in the world another option that one consumer could use, right? Um, it really has to be broadly substitutable. But I, I really want to focus on Sumit's point, which I think is absolutely right, that this is one of the, the problems and limitations that is holding antitrust law back from being able to effectively uh, promote competition in these markets. Um, what the legislation is recognizing is that the power of these companies, a lot of it comes from their vertical holdings. Um, that's something that's difficult to capture when we're focused on market definition questions. Historically, antitrust, uh, a monopolization case is not supposed to require defining the market. Um, you ought to be able to show harm directly um, without having to spend time defining the market. Um, it's frustrating that, that I, I think for many years, people went ahead, antitrust enforcers went ahead and did both, sort of a belt and suspenders thing, and now we seem to have lost the ability to um, show harm directly. But uh, that is one of the problems that I think these bills are trying to get at, although, of course, we do also need broader antitrust reform. Perhaps one point. I think I totally agree with you. I think a market definition is, um, is, is an overrated um, antitrust tool. Uh, we need a more nimble, more dynamic, more uh, just to look at the market realities to just rather than having bright rules say like you compete and then you outside market definition so you don't compete with that with with that company but market definition rules should be amended or stripped down uh, but it shouldn't be a, a, a pretext to see monopolies everywhere i mean just to quote a uh, nobel prize uh, winner ronald cause so like when economists don't understand uh, something they just go for a monopoly explanation um, of course we have this case of facebook where the courts say TikTok doesn't compete with Facebook. In Europe, we have Google Shopping say it doesn't compete with Amazon. And we can, we can just add up so many cases where the main competitor of that company that is investigated is just outside the market definition so that the market definition is so narrowly defined that, of course, you come for a monopolistic uh, explanation. Uh, I think we have to just look at things in a more evolutionary perspective, in a more time-consuming uh, uh, time, time ma manner, and, and that will help improve the antitrust analysis. So I would agree that market definition needs to be amended, if not just completely removed, but not just to explain that we should go only for even narrower approach so that we can have monopolistic explanations everywhere. So I would agree with reforming the tools, but not in uh, having an even more narrow, more, uh, uh, yeah, more narrow explanation. I'm just going to give a shout out to myself. Um, <laughs> in that, what my uh, contribution to the consortium's um, Facebook papers uh, work was actually going through a lot of Facebook's internal um, documents, looking at how it defines its competition. So I would just note that, you know, sometimes a company uh, sort of recognizes that it dominates in one space, but is competing with another in another space. Um, are there other questions that we have here? We have a couple more minutes. Yeah, right here. I'm totally ignorant of this whole thing, but I, that I, some thoughts come to mind that you didn't answer at all or didn't even address, including do you count companies as tech companies that position themselves as retailers like Walmart, uh, which competes with a, definitely with a tech company, as medical companies, pharma companies, others who are very much in pharma and insurance who are very much involved in tech. How do they figure into any of this plan for the Biden administration looking into regulating, overseeing, doing something with tech. And in some cases, the um, like medical uh, services are regulated at the state level, not at the national level, federal level. So how, how is that all going to play out in this? And as I say, I'm totally ignorant, so I'll believe anything you say. 
I'll just make one point that the uh, the two bills legislation are uh, really closely focused on the Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Facebook, etc. Uh, and on the other issues that you raise, pharma, etc. I'm going to pass it on and let others speak. So, I, if I we we had this little bit of disagreement earlier. The the way the bills are are de, are defined, who is covered would make it possible for particularly, say, a Walmart to be covered in the future in, um, in the Klobuchar Grassley bill. Well, I think, okay, let me just say, let me put it this way. If Walmart become Walmart is moving online, right, and it's gaining more online uh, subscribers, and if it becomes a substantial online business, sells many more services through the internet, then maybe, then it should be covered. Why not? Similarly, Facebook, you know, if, if these rules come into play and Facebook decides voluntarily to break up and spin off WhatsApp and Instagram and each of those companies are much smaller, then they should not be covered. I mean, I would not have an issue with any of those things changing dynamically as the market evolves. I appreciate you saying that because I think oftentimes the rhetoric is portrayed as the, the antitrust reform is just targeting, quote unquote, tech companies. Whereas when we're talking about antitrust reform more generally, either looking at actions that have occurred by the FTC or at some of these bills, while some of the spirit behind them may be related to how some of the politics around, quote unquote, big tech right now, the impact could be felt in other sectors. And I think we can certainly have a debate about whether or not that is a good or a bad thing. I, I would again point to the consumer welfare standard being an objective standard and a great tool to use. Um, but with that in mind, I think that that goes back to antitrust is about much more than just the tech sector. So the text of the legislation is very clear that it has to be an online platform um, and it has to have a very high market capitalization. So an important part of what Sumit's saying about how potentially Walmart could become covered in the future is if Walmart grew significantly in size. Um, so th th there's potential for that to happen far in the future. In terms of the um, impacts on other industries, though, I think that it could have a positive impact in that the power of the dominant digital tech firms may go down. Um, other companies are going to have a fair shake. And I think that's the impact that we'll see across the economy. Just, just one, one word on the, again, because it reverts back to the market definition. Uh, there's no such a thing as a digital company. Every company has a digital presence. I mean, in a post-COVID world we live in, how can you be a company and not have a digital presence? You just have competed. So the very idea in Europe to have the Digital Market Act means that you define digital market as opposed to what? As opposed to offline market? What is an offline presence? What is, it doesn't exist. There's no such a thing as a digital market. There's a digital industry. There's a digital channel amongst all the channels. But that's it, right? Look at advertising. There's digital advertising. There's TV advertising, print advertising, all this is part of advertising. Digital is just one mean of reaching the consumer. It's not like you have digital advertising that is completely outside competitive rivalry with TV advertising or print, print advertising. So to think that, okay, we're going to regulate online platforms, so it means that we make these bright lines again with what is online platforms and what is an offline company. But what is an offline company in the COVID? post-COVID world. This doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. So every company has a digital channel. Uh, and I mean, for example, you have these big companies like Amazon, but it, Amazon competes with Shopify, competes with any other companies that has an online platform, uh, online presence at least. So the idea of defining digital markets and to regulate this digital market so that offline companies are outside doesn't make sense. And precisely, it better and it creates unfair competition. Just let me give you an example. If you have financial payments, right? You, you all have Apple Pay, Google Pay. But can we say that banks, traditional banks, don't have a digital, digital presence? Of course, we all have apps from our traditional banks. So to what extent banks don't have a digital presence? And I think banks are quite a big incumbent in the financial industry. So shouldn't be, should they be exempt from antitrust prosecution or from antitrust scrutiny? I don't think so. I think there should be a 
a level playing field uh, so that we can create the conditions for fair competition and a common regulatory framework, not like different regulatory framework according to some discrete uh, uh, designation. I'm just going to make one brief point. Um, last week, the Justice Department sued um, United Healthcare over its acquisition of Change Healthcare. And the reason this is actually one of the most interesting court cases for the digital economy right now is the main point of this lawsuit is that they were concerned about the access to data and um, how much United Health was going to be able to know about its rivals based on acquiring this database data platform. So it, they're very much um, the agencies, which we didn't get to talk about as much on this panel as we had hoped. Um, are very cognizant that there are a lot of companies, like every company is a data company now, and how it is playing out in lots of different markets, fintechs, agriculture, and um, healthcare. Um, I